Please remain standing for the reading of the gospel. Today I will be reading from Mark 6, verses 30 through 34 and verses 53 through 56. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land at Genereset and moored the boat. Then they got out of the boat. People at once recognized him and rushed about that whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went, into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they much, might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Healing Hands. The series this summer, lifting up the healing ministries of Jesus Christ. Today we have two different type of crowds through. These crowds that Jesus drew to himself today in the very beginning of our session was one of those crowds that in some ways was an interfering crowd. As you uh, heard from our uh, children's director today about how Jesus thought it was so important that children directors get vacations, he was inviting his own uh, disciples after he had sent them on a missionary trip and they were coming back sharing with Jesus all the things that had taken place and all the lives that had been touched and the healing and the teaching ministry that had been performed, Jesus was taking them away to a quiet place, just like she said, kind of like a vacation, but this was a vacation that was interrupted, a vacation where people who were seeking after Jesus and his ministry got there before they did. It is a word. God uses these empty places like he has in the past, these deserted places, these wilderness experiences to create a new community, just like he did with Israel when they wandered in the wilderness for, for 50 days, 50 <laughs> years. <laughs> My story story. It's cutting. I realize that. So what do I need to do? Grab a handheld? All right. So you so you switching me over to this one now? That's okay. We'll get through it together. So at this quiet place, God has used these places in the past to create community. And when Jesus saw this crowd, even though he had had a predetermined reason for being there to take his disciples away to a quiet place, he still had compassion. And in this compassion for them, he asked them to sit down and he taught and he healed. And we also know that he went on to, to feed them the breaking of the bread and the fish and fed 5,000. This, this crowd was becoming potentially a, a new community of faith. Now, the second crowd, when Jesus crosses over uh, the lake, this is the one where he has stilled the storm. And when he gets out of the boat, people are coming to him. Crowds press in upon him. They want healing. 
from him. And in this time, he doesn't sit them down. He heals them. Even to the point that where people are pressing in so much that they're just touching the hems of his garment. I'll speak more to that in just a few moments. But one of the things that I do want you to know that, that it isn't only in Jesus' day that healing draws crowds. Healing today draws crowds. Ever heard of MD Anderson? Mayo's Clinic? West Cancer Clinic here in town? No, they're totally empty. No one ever goes to those things. They're, they're devoid of, of people. I don't even know how they stay in business. No, that's not quite the case, is it? And, and if you have ever been diagnosed with something where the doctor says, we're not really sure about what the procedures are for what you have, you immediately nowadays will go on the Internet and you will find other people who are blogging or talking about the same type of issues that you are having and where they are finding success and that you're all ready to go and to be where they are. Healing draws a crowd. My, my first experience of this in my teenage years was going with my grandmother down here to Memphis uh, she had a detached uh, and detaching retina. And uh, I don't know if you've ever heard of uh, Dr. Uh, David Myers or not, but he was uh, new uh, in this area then. And I think he was one of the first, if not the first, laser surgeons for eye care in our region. We left early in the morning. Uh, I think I told uh, the worship service this morning that we got there at 6. I think we actually left at 6 and got there by 8 to his office here in Memphis. And then we stayed until 9 o'clock that night. And when we got to the office, the office was already filled at 8 o'clock in the morning. I thought we all had the same appointment <laughs> at the same time. And it was amazing to, to hear the diversity of the issues with people's eyes and where they were from. They weren't all from West Tennessee. They were from around the world. What I also noticed was that the entrance into the, uh, the waiting area was not the same entrance that any of the doctors used. Dr. Meyer did not come in through the same door that we did. Could you imagine the chaos that would have created if the doctor walks through the waiting room? That's the kind of chaos that Jesus was involved in that day at Gennesareth. See, because that area that Jesus landed in was an area where people went to be healed. There were some warming pools, pools of water that were warmed by the geothermal uh, activity in that area. And those pools had been sites for healing and people gathered there so that already there was uh, enough people who needed healing, not because just they had heard that, about Jesus' healings, but because they were there to be healed in the first place, that the word had come to men that, that this was an area where they could be healed. And so as Jesus enters in, people are not concerned so much about his teaching or who he was. And if you look at this text, all this healing is done without faith and without any teaching taking place at all. Some of the scholars say that this is an epiphany moment, revealing God's divinity in Christ Jesus, his capacity to do miracles with people. But one of the things that I see in this is that there was no prerequisite required for God to work in someone's life. Even though people had a desire in their own heart for healing, Jesus didn't sit there and say, until you listen to my five-point sermon on healing and the roles in which God plays. You know, until you confess that I am your Lord and your Savior, uh, no. It, it was so lack of a relationship 
that Mark notes that all people had to do was to reach out and touch the hem of his garment. Meaning that people were not as interested in knowing who and what Jesus was or is or could be for them as much as they were concerned about the issue that was facing them in life. Even though in this crowd it doesn't say that Jesus showed compassion, I think that is a hallmark of how he interacted with all of us. So you might be asking yourself today, you know, I, I'm not necessarily in need of healing myself. I'm fortunate. I'm in good health. Where does that leave me in this story today? Well, remember who Jesus took with him, his disciples. This was a teaching moment for them, seeing how Jesus interacted with the crowds, with the people around them. Cecilia was a starting freshman at Oxford in the mid-1940s. And she wasn't really sure what her major would be or how she would use her college education. So for those of you that have grandchildren or those of you in college now, not much has changed since 1940. Many people are still trying to cram four years of college into five or six. So just be at peace. But while she was there, she ran into an English professor uh, named C.S. Lewis. And through her experience of him, she became a follower of Jesus Christ, a, a Christian, a disciple of Jesus. And so she knew that, that for her life to have really any meaning, it needed to be in service to her fellow human being, her brothers and sisters in the world. So she went to nursing school another three years. And when she completed her nursing uh, school and certification, she uh, was a nurse in London at one of the hospitals and in a cancer ward. And she started to notice that when someone was, was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and that there was now no longer any medicine, uh, and this was like in the 50s, that there was really nothing more than the hospital could do. She noticed that the patient got less visits from the doctor and also less visits from friends and family. And even to the point she noticed that in the cancer wings, some people would die alone. No one at their bedside. And so she brought this to the attention of uh, the staff nurse in front of her and then finally up before uh, the, the organization, the leadership of the hospital to see if there was some plan that they could put in place. Uh, could they organize uh, some methodology of, of taking care of these people who are diagnosed with terminal cancer? And, and the hospital did see and understand but but did not think that it was really their place and so uh, they refused to look into this with her I don't know whether or not she thought because she was a nurse that that her opinions or her ideas uh, didn't credit uh, that of a doctor or not but it did inspire her to go back to school at 33 years of age to become a medical doctor now, I don't know about you, but another five years of school, maybe even seven years when you put in your specialty, I don't know if that's necessarily something you want to do at 33 <laughs> when you already have a career path, one who's already serving people and doing it well. But she did. And her ministry was devoted to that particular area of, of how to help people when they're terminally ill. This ministry that she started in England came to the United States, and we now know it as hospice. I think that she had the eyes of Jesus where she saw a group of people masked who she had compassion for. 
And I think that is what God could be asking of those of us here present who are fortunate to have good health and, and good life is when we, when we see a need and, and we see that it's not being filled, how we might prepare ourselves and others to, to reach out and to make a difference and to change. For any of you who've ever had a, uh, a loved one go through hospice, you're probably deeply appreciative of the nursing staff and the doctors and the chaplains and in the whole system that tries to help you through that difficult time in life that your loved one doesn't die alone. Isn't it nice to know that the root of that ministry is found in the heart of a follower of Jesus Christ, someone trying to to live out what it means to be a disciple, to have compassion on the crowd. So what is asked of you this day? Well, some of you have noticed that in the bulletin there is a card for you that if you have a moment in your life that where you have felt God's healing touch in your life, where you have felt somebody uh, be uh, helpful for you during uh, a time that, that has helped you heal. That could be emotional, that could be physical, that could be a, an illness. We're asking you in just a few moments to take that card out and to, to fill it out. But also for many of you that this coming Thursday at 6 o'clock at the sanctuary in the square, we're having a healing service. And many of you have been praying for friends who've asked you to put them on our prayer list because they are in need of God's healing touch. And what I want you to know is that, there, that there's not any uh, prerequisites that your friend needs to come to this healing service. Just as there was none when Jesus met the horde that crushed in upon him and just wanted to touch the hem of his garment. There were no prerequisites to the healings that took place that day. What I have noticed about God is that God continually to act first in our life. And maybe one of the first ways that God will work in some of your friend's life is through God's healing presence and touch. Or how God uses you to be a healing, peaceful presence in their life. So one of the things that you can do today is if you want to share with us how God has worked in your life and filling that out, we'd ask you to do so. This Thursday, you can invite some of your friends and be a participant in that service on Thursday at the square at 6 o'clock. So as we close this time of worship together, we're going to have uh, some music being played. You can pull out the card. You can fill that out. And when you have it filled out, we would ask you to come to the chancel rail. And we ask you to lay your cards in the basket. And then if you'd like a time of prayer, to please come and to kneel in prayer as well. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.